So this segment is intended to be part of my 2024 new media video, uh, part 2 of course, but because this is one of the few non-versus things that people want my opinion on, I'll give my two cents now that Australia finally got around to showing it near me at a time later than 5am in the morning. Also yeah, if the editing is not quite as like up to snuff as you might expect, uh, that's because this is meant to be just part of that video. Uh, I'm terrified of copyright and I don't even have the full movie to actually show you anything interesting, so... And I'm not gonna use, like, fucking cinema recorded footage or pirated... I'm not gonna do that. I'm just, just gonna have the poster, uh, just hear me ramble. Transformers 1, the long-awaited fourth animated Transformers film, and a retelling of the classic origin story of Ultimus Prime and Megatron that we've known for a while, with a few unique elements to give it its own twist. I don't feel like going into the shit-ass marketing because everyone knows that this movie inspired no confidence until the trailers that basically spoiled the entire movie. And that makes some degree of sense because the first third of the movie of which you could show stuff without spoiling does contain a lot of just... bad jokes. The comedy of this movie wasn't quite as dead to me as for some others. I personally enjoyed the jokes revolving around Orion and Dee because even if they weren't funny, the extent to which they were comfortable saying anything around another was a good way to show their friendship. I know people say... I know people love shipping the two, but for me, I genuinely felt this is a fantastic depiction of just a normal friendship between mates. I'm so used to friendships in movies being depicted in a way that's kind of only going halfway and not committing to the fact that real genuinely close friends don't have many barriers between one another. Biff constantly threatens to descend a rain of hammers upon me, and that is something I thought about whenever Dee just casually threatened Orion with death. Not that I'm trying to say you're not allowed to interpret the movie the way you do, because that'd be hilariously short-sighted of anyone who actually watched the movie to say that and still be on board with it. Just that I interpreted it this way and I really like that and if you can take, if anything you can take it as a testament to how applicable the writing overall can be with them. On the other hand, B I was very much not fond of in the trailers and in the movie, he wasn't quite as bad as I thought he'd be. I definitely didn't find him funny a lot of the time, but I didn't hate him. There came a point when my eyes glazed over and I stopped acknowledging his attempts at comedy entirely. I guess it also helps that every character around him can't fucking stand him. I think my favourite joke of them was that sudden run he does, mostly because I didn't remember from the trailer and it didn't involve him talking. His performance is not the best. Neither is Alita's, but at least it felt like Alita won. But Hemsworth and Henry as Orion and Dee are something else. Those two do such an amazing job of evolving their voices over time going from sounding like any ordinary Joe into developing their more iconic style of voice by the end of the film. Orion slowly getting that baritone, wise inflection, and Dee getting that sinister, arrogant, violent tone. Pretty much all the best stuff in this movie can be traced back to those two, because all the social commentary in the world could not make a good movie if it didn't have anything to make you care about the world and characters. And it does a lot to make you care about these two. One thing I especially like was that you don't get to see the moment they actually met until the end of the film. I think it does so much to help the emotional impact of it. You don't need this scene at the start, the opening establishes their relationship well enough and how close they are. So you're seeing this for the first time directly after the scene where they break apart and framed as Optimus thinking back to the moment they met makes it a lot more powerful. Though not as powerful as one scene, the moment Megatron is truly born. Which is genuinely shocking, especially because it seems like for a moment Orion's actions may have saved Dee from going down the wrong path. But speaking of, while the movie does take sides on who's wrong and who's right, what I really appreciate is where it takes the side on. The movie and Optimus never say that Sentinel Prime doesn't deserve to die. With all he does in this movie as the big bad and how messed up he is, the movie does want you to root for D16 and make us fall into this state completely believable. Optimus also sees this, and in knowing that Sentinel probably does deserve to die, but choosing to protect him anyway makes him seem all the nobler. All while getting across the idea that it's not Sentinel's death that matters, but the way in which Megatron taking him out will change who he is. He's not saying, No, Sentinel deserves to live, Megatron. He's saying that if D16 goes through with this, he will become closer to Sentinel and cross into the line where, once killing in cold blood becomes beneath you, all sorts of atrocities will do. Sentinel was already beaten, there was nothing left he could do, but D wanted to kill him while Orion wanted to stop him. It's that battle between idealism and pragmatism. Dee's path would always have worked to get rid of the problem, but Orion's path, if working, would solve more problems than just one. A simple solution that creates more problems as the price of solving the big one, or a harder solution that solves more problems at a higher risk of failure. It's a very real and believable conflict, and I can understand both sides. We see that the problem with Megatron's actions is that he's just too short-sighted overall seeing all of Sentinel's allies as conspirators supporting him, instead of realizing that some of them were just as blind as himself. 
Again, killing every one of them will get the job done, but it's not the most efficient way to do it that Optimus would likely go with. And obviously one has to acknowledge how the movie shows the divide between social classes. The way those in power, not just at the top but even just their enforcers, will throw their weight around and abuse their power over others for their own amusement. The ways in which Sentinel forces the Cybertronians to live as he deems right, revising history to fit his own image and silencing anyone who is a minor inconvenience. Sentinel is the perfect hate sink in this movie, carried by such a wonderful performance and a deliciously sinister character. Everyone in their left nibble could see he was going to be the villain and the movie gives us plenty of time to enjoy him as a villain instead of leaving the reveal to just one scene on its own, or while making the extent of his villainy more of what's revealed than just the villainy itself. Speaking of the pacing of this movie, I thought it was quite good. A good chunk of time is spent with the character's smaller body, so the impact of them getting their T-Cogs and becoming more like we know them is a lot more effective than if, say, we only got 10 minutes to get used to their bodies and then they just immediately got the T-Cogs because they didn't want you to walk out of the movie because they didn't look recognizable. It makes it all feel like it matters, and then the way they slowly continue growing with their weaponry and all that, it makes it feel satisfying to see it happen. And the pacing of D-16's transformation into Megatron and the honestly chillingly realistic depiction of a man taking a symbol from the past and transforming it into a symbol of hate is not lost on me. What I will say is a problem is that, I don't know, the way in which Sentinel kind of just spills the beans after being asked once for no reason, and that being used as his downfall via recording is a bit lame, especially because it doesn't matter. There's plenty of scenes from this movie alone that could be used for that. They could have either had Orion could properly grill Sentinel to get the responses he wanted, or they could have played Sentinel's execution of Alpha Trion on the big screen and had a scene showing Orion and D-16's reactions to seeing that firsthand given they weren't there and how seeing it only strengthens their resolve to do what they think is right. I still thought Sentinel was a fantastic villain, playing very true to his aligned and animated selves, which is interesting because this movie takes mostly from G1. Sentinel doesn't actually take much from his IDW self though and nothing from his actual G1 self. But I guess it fits for him to take from the aligned Sentinel Zeta Prime when his main enforcer is Arachnid, which was cool to see. In general, a lot of cameos in this movie are really cool. From the minor roles like Staff Game, Soundwave, and Shockwave, the former is still getting to do very important things for the plot, and with great performances, to just completely inconsequential cameos like seeing Iron Eyes, Sideswipe, Mirage, a few others in the background, seeing fucking Mean Streak on the Iacon 5000 board, hearing the name Skyfire in a piece of Transformers media that isn't the first season of the G1 cartoon, seeing the Primes, and even seeing them take the design cues from various parts of history. Notably, Onyx Prime and Vector Prime especially look like great versions of their Aligned and Cybertron designs, though Vector is pretty consistent, I admit, and he always looks awesome. I only got to watch the movie once, so I'll probably pick up on more as I rewatch it in the future, and I absolutely will. And I mentioned the obvious fact that the movie looks phenomenal. The visuals are so good, with all the models looking fantastic and finally steering us away from just the blanket evergreen designs to do something a bit more interesting while not being too far away for Hashtag to piss and shit the bed. It's not all perfect, the faces sometimes look a little uncanny, though not as often as I was expecting, and... No, that's it, I don't know what's wrong. It looks great, the action's phenomenal, the effects are stunning, some of the cinematography and framing is genuinely great. I always think back to how the surface looks when everyone first arrives on it, with the starry night sky on one side and the rising sun on the other, allowing us and them to see Cybertron both in the day and at the night at the same time, and giving us that gorgeous warm glow against the metallic surface to really emphasize the metal planet nature of the world. But yeah, the action in particular is great. Seeing the characters go from completely useless to barely capable because they're winging it, to actually becoming competent fighters is very satisfying, especially as the heroes slowly do better and better as time goes on. From losing horribly, to running from conflict, to fighting back but still losing, to fighting back better but still losing, to actually finally winning. And the final battle with Optimus rising through the ground and facing Megatron is so good. Though even before the fight, I love how the film shows the two on their path simultaneously to becoming who they were meant to be. D-16 in a campaign of carnage, tearing someone who has already lost and was no longer a threat in half, declaring for all to hear that he has crowned himself Megatron, taking the name of a powerful figure to help himself, and Orion falling after his noble sacrifice to the core of Primus, being given the matrix of leadership because he earned it, with the others around him deciding that he deserves to have a name evocative of those before him, Optimus Prime. Plus, it helps the idea that the two see each other as what they think Sentinel is. They're both correct in what they think of Sentinel, but now they see each other as being like Sentinel. Optimus sees Megatron as a corrupt man who will destroy anything in his way to create a world that he thinks should exist, because Optimus dislikes Sentinel more for what he did to the world. Megatron sees Optimus as an aggrandizing prime he can no longer trust, 
someone that spouts the same platitudes as Sentinel did and thus is just as untrustworthy and potentially corrupt. Because Megatron cared more about how Sentinel personally lied and betrayed everyone. To Optimus, if Sentinel had told the truth, it wouldn't have changed anything, his actions were corrupt. To Megatron, if Sentinel was doing something noble, it wouldn't have changed anything, because his words were corrupt. So in the end, even in death, Sentinel stays winning. And that's the most tragic part of it all. And just as a Transformers fan, there's so much to geek out about. Soundwave and Alpha Trion get to actually use their toy-only alternate modes from the Studio Series Bumblebee movie and Titans Return Voyager figures. Darkwing is on the big fucking screen of all characters as a major asshole. Redwing is one of the Seekers for some reason. The film opens by mentioning Primus resembling his design from Cybertron but colored like his Dreamwave self. The Quintessons are based on the Covenant of Primus interpretation that have never been seen this way. One of the fake names given to the 13 Primes by Sentinel to help cover up that he's not one of them is the Council of Elders, which is from fucking Beast Machines. Soundwave has a fucking lie detecting power he used in only one episode against Chip Chase. Help Megatron finally uses Rise Up in a film, which is his perfect counter to roll out that was introduced and animated and has always fit this origin of story of Megatron the best. The movie is just fantastic. While the first act could be better and the overall comedy isn't the funniest, I see this as the kind of movie I brought up in the past. The kind of movie that kids can watch and love, then grow up and learn to appreciate even more than they did when they were younger. An intelligent and meaningful movie that accompanies mindlessly cool action and spectacle to entertain all ages, with fantastic writing and commentary to be made, and endless love for the franchise. After Bumblebee and Rise of the Beast began to show the spark of the Transformers brand, this movie finally brings the heart and soul of it to the big screen for maybe the first time ever at this extent. Its poor performance is a tragedy, and the people pining for it to fail because they want Bay back without ever watching the movie should be ashamed. They won't be because they're too dense to realize that Michael Bay was still involved in this movie as the fucking producer, which I guess the average person doesn't realize is extremely important as a role. Support this movie as much as you can, please. I implore you to give it a shot and hopefully love it as I have. The difficulty I had being able to watch this in Australia is a shame. Though the amusement is not lost on me that my second favorite franchise ever is Godzilla and that Godzilla minus one is the last movie I had this much difficulty watching in cinemas. Maybe Australia just hates me and my favorite franchise's newest movies with the word one in the title. Okay, that's all for this video. I probably slapped this whole thing in my 2024 new media video because that's what this was meant for and it's a movie, not a video game. This will be far from the longest of that segment.